So it's 2020 and everything is fucked for the immediate foreseeable future, which naturally means it's time for me to explain what the heck Magic Story has been about for the past six years. Years of story and planning went into the grand finale of War of the Spark, so let's go through it to find out exactly who this big evil dragon is. This is the entire Nicol Bolas story in 15 minutes. Part 1. The Early Days The story starts several millennia ago on the plain of Dominaria, when a great being known as the Ur-Dragon flapped its wings, causing an egg to fall from the sky. Inside this egg were two twin Elder Dragons named Ugin and Nickel. No, not Nickel Bolas, that bit comes later. What is an Elder Dragon, you might be wondering? Well, it seems the only qualification is to be born by God sloughing his dandruff off, but they also have a few key identifiers. Elder Dragons are all born knowing their own names, and they all have two. Palladium Amores, Arcady Sabath, Barack Obama, etc. The notable exception being the twins, who, since they were born from the same egg, share a name. Elder Dragons also come with a fun little magic trick they can do. Ujin has invisible fire, and Nicol Bolas makes people go crazy when he touches them. Unlike some villains in pop culture, Nicol doesn't actually have a reason for being a huge dick. He's just a huge dick. He believes himself to be the ultimate life form and that all should be owed to him. Ujin and Nicol spend a few centuries living peacefully on Dominaria, but at some point Nicol's Napoleon complex gets the better of him and he decides he does want two names, just like the other Elder Dragon, so he gives himself the name Bolas. Then he decides it's finally time to take over the world. He tricks his brother Ujin into becoming a pawn for his master plan. The discovery of this fact shocks Ujin Ujin's so bad that his planeswalker spark ignites and he vanishes into thin air, planeswalking away to the multiverse. Meanwhile, back on Dominaria, Nickel thinks he just killed his brother, so he gives a non-committal shrug and goes back to taking over the world, starting the Elder Dragon War, a war which sounds much more exciting and important than it actually is. The Elder Dragon War mostly consists of Bolas tricking the other Elder Dragons into fighting each other while he drinks mimosas on the beach. Right at the end of the Elder Dragon War, Nickel Bolas' army is about to clash with the last remaining enemy, Arcady Sabath, when Ujin thinks, hmm, maybe I should stop trapezing around the multiverse and go check on my dickhead brother in case he's doing genocide. So he reappears in Dominaria to discover, in fact, his brother is doing genocide. So he rubs planeswalking right in Bolas' face, and Bolas gets so mad that Mom let Ujin have a present that he couldn't have that his planeswalker spark ignites too. The two brothers chase each other around the multiverse for a few hundred years, eventually landing back in the least interesting place in the multiverse the Meditation Plane, where Ujin just gives up and lets Bolas kill him. But he doesn't actually die, he just comes back as Gandalf the White. Around this point, Bolas comes into the possession of the Gem of Becoming, that's the big oval thing between his horns. He uses this gem for its significant power, but unbeknownst to Nickel, the gem is actually a piece of Ujin and lets his brother spy on him undetected. Part 1.5, the unimportant part that's actually slightly important. Nickel kills a big planeswalking demon thing on Dominaria, and eats it for breakfast. This fight inadvertently opens up a time rift, which means it's time for our first side tangent to explain critical information. Way back in the day, planeswalkers were basically gods. They were functionally immortal and they had power strong enough to create entire planes. Every time one of these walk and talk and plagues upon the universe got to a bit of a scrap with one another, it tore a little hole in the fabric of space and time because of their pure imbalance of power. Rifts like this start popping up all over the place, mostly on Dominaria, and they start to become a real problem. Problem. Part 2, the part where the good guys don't win just yet. Ujin the White wants to stop his brother from doing murder on the entire multiverse, so he finds an allies with another planeswalker named Azor. Together they form a plan to stop Nicol Bolas forever, which basically boils down to making a device which stops planeswalkers from planeswalking, and then they'll bait Nicol into it so that he can totally ruin just the one plane instead of all of them. Azor makes the device on Ixalan, sacrificing his own spark in the process, but unfortunately his sacrifice is in vain because Azor is a big, dumb idiot who leaves statues of himself all over the planes that he visits. Bolas, in his travels around the countryside, sees those statues and thinks, hmm, maybe that's something I should be worried about, and in the process of looking for answers about Azor, runs into Ujin while he's setting up the mousetrap game board. Furious that Ujin is both alive and playing board games without him, they get into another fight and Ujin is killed on Tarkir. Part 3, the part where the time rifts from earlier are important. 
Nickel goes back to Dominaria to finally finish all that taking over the world business and successfully does so for about 400 years, before his own champion, Tetsuo Umezawa, manages to successfully assassinate him. Don't worry though, just like Ujin, the power of Deus Ex Machina and canonical retcon by the Wizard's story team is strongly on the side of old Nikki B, so he uses his ghost to reach into one of the timers from earlier and makes a copy of his body from before he died. Neat. Now that he's back in business, Nickel gets into a fight with some other planeswalkers, Venser, Teferi, and some other cats who never got cards like Lashrak and Jessica. Nickel kills Teferi, and while he's playing with Teferi's severed head, Teferi's severed head tells him about how the entire multiverse is about to explode because there are too many time rifts. Nickel agrees that you can't take over the multiverse if there is no multiverse, so he lets Teferi have his head back and lets them sort it all out. Part 4, The Mending. Teferi and his friends fix all the time rifts in an event called The Mending by giving up their lives and their planeswalker sparks. This stopped the entire multiverse from exploding, but it also fundamentally changed how Planeswalker Sparks worked for everyone. From this point onward, no one had their godlike omnipotence anymore, and no one was immortal either unless you had other ways of doing it. Quickly, Bolas feels his aeons of collected power draining from him, but don't worry, he's got a master scheme that will eventually coalesce in him regaining his former glory and taking over the multiverse. Starting with Part 5, Amonkhet. Bolas shows up on Amonkhet and immediately raises the entire plane except for one city. He then kills every living adult, and then confronts the eight gods of the plane, killing three of them, mind controlling four, and the last one kinda just agrees to join up because he's the worst. Then Bolas forms the society of the world into a religion which worships him and strives to attain the afterlife by succeeding in five trials. The actual function of these trials is for the whole plane to spend their days doing nothing but training themselves into peak physical shape. The ones who are strong enough to pass the trials are set aside turned into super zombies embalmed in Lazatep, a naturally occurring mineral on the plane with interesting necromantic properties. Part 6, Nicol Bolas recruits some friends. The super zombie factory is up and running now so it's time to go get some pawns and play Tezzeret kinda just falls directly into his lap, Jace, Frasca, Liliana, Ralz, Eric, and a few others do some menial labor for him, and Sarkon Vol, who is just really horny for dragons, joins up on Team Horns. Part 7, Alara! Whoa, would you look at the time, the five shards of Alara are about to crash into one another and Nickel really wants to be there so he can eat it like a bowl of Lucky Charms. Unfortunately for him, a Johnny kinda just runs into him while he was doing other things and decides he's gonna pick a fight. He uses Bolas' own soul against him and Ajani scores a critical blow against the Elder Dragon, forcing him to planeswalk away. Part 8, the Eldrazi. Bolas discovers Ujin's long-lost interplanar stopgap is on Zendikar, so he tricks Sarkon, Jace, and Chandra into cracking it open, releasing the Eldrazi onto the plane of Zendikar. Why did he do this? Who knows? Just because he's a dick, I guess. Interestingly, you can probably draw a straight line from this random act of multiplanar eco-terrorism to his own defeat, because it inadvertently leads to the creation of Part 9, The Gate Watch. Jace, Chandra, Gideon, and Nyssa all join forces to kill the Eldrazi, and they manage to get two out of three of them while they're still on Zendikar. Surprise! It's time for another side tangent to exposit some more relevant information that happens right around this point in the story in a different place. After Bolas tricked him into releasing the Eldrazi, Sarkon has some doubts about his love affair with Nicol Bolas, so he goes back to his own home plane of Tarkir for some R&R. As luck would have it though, there's no rest for the crazy and Sarkon is tormented by a spooky ghost. The spooky ghost leads him to Ujin's dead body and after poking with a stick, Sarkon time travels 2,000 years back in time to the moment right before Nicol Bolas kills Ujin. Where Ujin's body lands, Sarkon constructs him a healing cocoon where Ujin can rest up and put his ghost in a box for the next few millennia. Then Sarkon travels back to the future to a new timeline where Ujin isn't dead and all the dragons are still alive. Part 10, Innistrad. The third Eldrazi Emrakul heads over to Innistrad, lured there by the Lithomancer and ancient planeswalker Nahiri. Nahiri really wants Emrakul to blow up Innistrad because it was Soren's idea to trap Emrakul on Zendikar in the first place and now she wants revenge for her destroyed plane. The Gatewatch enlists the help of Liliana Vess and Tamio to trap the flying spaghetti monster in Innistrad's moon. Liliana joins the Fellowship and they all head to Part 11, Kaladesh. After defeating the last Eldrazi, the League of Super Friends head to Jace's bachelor pad on Ravnica to think about which interplanar threat they should be facing next. Before anyone can come up with an actually good answer, Dovin Bond has heard about the Gatewatch and he wants to hire them to work security for the Inventor's Fair on Kaladesh. The Fast Five says they don't really do small gig, but Chandra gets all... Kaladesh. 
Haven't heard that name in years. And heads over to Kaladesh to see what's poppin'. Turns out what's poppin' is that Dovin Bon is actually a pawn of Nicol Bolas as well, and him and Tezzeret are running Kaladesh like a fascist police state. Also, it turns out the Inventor's Fair is actually a scheme from Bolas to get someone on the plane to accidentally invent a planer bridge, a device that will let non-planeswalkers move between the planes. Luckily for Bolas, his absolutely batshit crazy scheme, which entirely hinges on some random dude on Kaladesh accidentally inventing a planer bridge, someone on Kaladesh accidentally invents a planar bridge. Unfortunately for Bolas, Dovin Bond just tried to hire the literal only people in the multiverse with the knowledge and means to try and stop that batshit crazy plan so that they could do bouncer work. The Planeteers, with the help of a Johnny, who is also just kind of here by the way, help Chandra's mom overthrow the authoritarian police state. Liliana doesn't like Tezzeret, so she goes to fight him, killing him and destroying the planar bridge. But the twists just keep coming on Kaladesh as we later find out she won, didn't actually kill Tezzeret, and two, didn't actually destroy the planar bridge. Part 12, Amonkhet again! After the fascism is over party and more than a healthy amount of sexual tension, Frankie and the Four Seasons, which now includes a Johnny, start to put the pieces together and realize Nicol Bolas might be a bit of a bad dude. Johnny confirms this and tells him about how he totally kicked his ass back in middle school, but they shouldn't try to because they're not strong enough. The Power Rangers completely ignore this warning and head over to Amonkhet. The Spice Girls dick around for a few days, Liliana ganks one of her last two demonic contract demons before Big and B, much like someone who just remembered they have an idol clicker game going, shows up to collect his millennia's worth of super zombies, resulting in a full-scale apocalypse for the plane of Amonkhet complete with rivers of blood and everything. The mystery gang challenge him to a duel, but Nicol Bolas effortlessly defeats all five without even breaking a sweat. Gideon, Liliana, Chandra, and Nyssa all tactical retreat to their pre-arranged meeting point of Dominaria. Bolas tries to read Jace's mind, but luckily for Jace, Ujin put a safeguard on Jace's memory that if anyone ever tries to read Jace's mind for memories regarding Ujin, he'll instinctively planeswalk to Ixalan. Part 13, Jace instinctively planeswalks to Ixalan, but not before Nicol Bolas wipes the entirety of his memory. Cast away and with no knowledge of even his own name, Jace finds himself unable to planeswalk away from Ixalan. Eventually, he's picked up by his old arch nemesis, Vraska. Nicol Bolas has given Vraska a compass and promised if she brings him what it points to, then he'll put her in charge of the Golgari. So she and the clueless boy have an action-packed, hormone-driven pirate adventure race against time to beat the natives of the plane to the treasure, while somehow finding time to flirt incessantly. Jace falls down a waterfall, gets all his memories back, and remembers that doing things for Bolas is probably a bad idea. After a long trek and more than a healthy amount of sexual tension, the pair find Azor, way back from part 2 as well as the Immortal Sun, an artifact which stops planeswalkers from being able to planeswalk. Knowing what he knows about Bolas being a real bad dude, Jace forms a scheme. They'll let Bolas think Vraska was on his side and then later turn the tables on him once they know what his evil plan is. So he wipes Vraska's memories about how they totally bone down to be given back at a later time when it would be more advantageous to have the knowledge of them totally boning down, then lets Vraska call Tezzeret to activate the planar bridge so she can deliver the Immortal Sun to Bolas and claim her reward. Part 14, Dominaria. Simultaneous to all that Ixalan stuff happening, four out of five Gatewatch members show up on Dominaria. After getting brutally wrecked so hard, Nissa alts at fours and Chandra decides she's gonna do some solo queuing for a bit and goes elsewhere on Dominaria, leaving just Gideon and Liliana to advance the plot by themselves. Liliana just has one demon left to kill to free herself from her contract and conveniently that same demon is both on Dominaria and has a magic sword that can kill elder dragons. What a bargain. So the two embark on a quest to go get the Black Blade and they make some friends along the way, such as Karn and Jaya. They reunite with Chandra and Jace, get the sword, kill the demon, and then all head to Ravnica for Jace's bachelor pad. Before Liliana can leave Dominaria, Bolas reveals that if all four demonic contract holders are gone, Lily's contract actually defaults to him, meaning she's fully under his control. Part 15, the part where Greg Wiseman fucks everything up. Back on Ravnica, Nicol Bolas tricks Niv Mizzet into creating an interplanar beacon, a device which magically calls all planeswalkers in the multiverse to its location. Frasca bumps her head and gets all her memories back about how she and Jace totally boned down, and despite knowing about the Giga Chad that is Jace Bellerin, she decides to murder and betray everyone anyway. So she kills Asperia, letting Dovin Bond become the Azorius Guildmaster. Frasca then enjoys a bit of time as the head of the Golgari, but then says, fuck it, I'm a pirate, and goes to chill on her boat on Ixalan until it all blows over. Part 16, The War of the Spark. 
So now with everything in place, Bolas is finally ready to regain his lost power and take over the multiverse. He boots up the Immortal Sun and the Interplanar Beacon, calling every Planeswalker to Ravnica from where they'll be unable to escape. Tezzeret opens up the Planar Bridge, and Liliana commands the army of millions of eternalized super zombies to kill everything in sight. The funny thing about the Eternals is they can be used to cast the Elder Spell, a spell which has apparently existed this entire time, but so far no one's been crazy enough to actually use it. The Eternals start grabbing Planeswalkers and with the Elder Spell rip their sparks out of them, killing both parties and delivering that spark and all of its power to the big guy himself. Everything is going peachy keen until Liliana decides she doesn't actually like killing everyone just because a dragon told her to, so she commands the zombie gods from Amonkhet to de-spark Nicol Bolas. Breaking her contract would have killed her, but Gideon decides to take the damage for her instead because he's just a nice guy like that. Before Bolas dies, Ujin telepathically calls Jace and tells him all about how staying dead is really hard for Elder Dragons, so he needs Jace to make an illusion of Bolas dying so everyone will think Bolas is dead, when in reality, at the last second, Ujin swoops in and brings the no longer a Planeswalker Bolas to Ujin's meditation realm, where Ujin will act as gatekeeper for the rest of time. And that's it, that's the whole story more or less. I thought we were done with it, but apparently a few of the dragon schemes are still ongoing because he was up to something in the most recent set, Akoria, so who really knows?